uh, through the day, help us out of you this morning. And thank you just for all that you do for us. And I look forward to what you're going to do during this service. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Oh, I was going to wait for Jeff to come up and leave the singing, but you're already back, back there. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, good morning. Um, welcome. Welcome to the coolness. <laughs> um, we're starting out, and we're going to use the brown hymnals. So if you would turn to 363 in the brown hymnal, and all who are able, please stand. 363 in the brown hymnal.
end of summer's heaven. I have read and heard about heaven. It's the place I long to see. In the Bible we're told of its beauty. My Lord's preparing a place for me. Heaven, can you imagine all the No more heartaches for cares, no more burdens to bear. Twin alas for all eternity. You can't buy your way into heaven. There is just one way to go. For the Oh, come on into the crimson flow. Heaven, can you imagine all the peace and tranquility? No more heartaches nor cares, no more burdens to bear. Twin the last for all eternity. When we reach that wonderful city and the Savior's face we see, we shall live in his glory forever. Oh, won't you come on and go with me? Heaven, can you imagine all the peace and tranquility? No more heartaches nor cares, no more burdens to bear. Twin the last for all eternity. Thank you. Thank you. Aren't you glad of that? Mm -hmm. Say, preacher, can you know for sure we're going to heaven? life in his son. He that hath the son hath life, and he that hath not the son of God hath not life. If you've got the son of God, you've got the assurance of heaven this morning. <laughs> right of Hebrews says, wherefore he's able to save unto the uttermost them that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for him. I'm glad that we can know for certain that we're going to heaven, and I hope you know that this morning. I hope your faith and trust is in Jesus Christ. Again, the Bible says there's none other name given unto heaven among men whereby we must be saved. And so if you want to be saved, you're going to have to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, John said, Behold, the Lamb of God has taken the way to sin the world. I'm glad we can know for sure we're going to heaven. But I'm glad that we can know for sure that God's going to take care of us until we get there. Uh, thought about the events of last night. I was upstairs and of course, I don't ever watch the news. And so Tammy, when I come down, she said, do you hear about President Trump? And I said, no. And so then I got to looking about it, and then I thought, my, 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 what in the world have we come to? And, uh, but anyway, in our text, we're gonna read from Isaiah chapter number six this morning. Isaiah chapter number six. You have to admit that we live in uncertain times. Uh, I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, or Independent, you've got to admit that we live in uncertain times. And so, you, know, you stop and think about all that's going on in the world, it's not only in our nation, but then you stop and think about what's all going on with China, and they're putting warships in Japan, around Japan, Taiwan, and now off to off the uh, Alaskan coast. We got to the fiasco over in Ukraine that's been going on for some time now. And, uh, you know, North Korea is now beginning again, once again, to, to try to make themselves look big and bad and just uncertain times. 
And uh, so that was what Isaiah was facing here in Isaiah chapter number 6. Let me read Isaiah chapter number 6, verses 1 through verse number 4. Now, I still got another message in Isaiah chapter number 1 that I hadn't. Uh, so we got the first message out of Isaiah 1, but we've got another one in there that uh, I want to talk about the invitation that God made to the nation of Israel. And uh, let me say again, now I'm going to try to, to hit some of the highlights in Isaiah. So if you've got a favorite passage in the book of Isaiah that you want preached on, you let me know. And uh, we'll, we'll see if we can include that in it. And uh, so anyhow, so, but, uh, I thought today it would be good to, to look at this passage of Scripture and find out that, uh, that you know, God's still in control. Isaiah chapter number 6, beginning in verse number 1, says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now, next week, I'm going to try to get uh, the, the effects that this vision had on Isaiah. But this week, I want to talk to you about the, the vision itself. And so, I pray that God will help us this morning. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for your goodness. Help us to say exactly what you need us, that we need to say this morning. And Lord, uh, may we not say anything that would be displeasing to you. And so guard our lips and guide our, our thinking and, and, uh, and direct us as we try to, to give to the folks here this morning what you have for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, he says, in the year that King Uzziah died. And, uh, so this is a turbulent time. Remember now, Isaiah has, or Uzziah has been a king for 52 years now. And uh, basically, Isaiah grew up under Uzziah. So, in 52 years, I don't care how old you are when you start, that's a pretty good time. You can say, I grew up under this man. And so we're going to look a little bit at Uzziah. Turn back with me to 2 Chronicles chapter number 26. 2 Chronicles chapter number 26. Second Chronicles chapter number 26. And now I'm going to begin reading the verse number 1. It says, uh, then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. And he built Eloth and restored it to Judah. And after that, the king slept with his fathers. 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign. And he reigned 15, two years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And so you see here that uh, Uzziah reigned from the age of 16 to for 52 years. And so, uh, so he, reigned, he reigned a long time. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And uh, so he was a good king. According to verse number four, he said he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. And so he was a good king. And God helped him if you look in uh, Again, in verse number four, and, uh, over, yeah, we did verse number four. Again, in verse number five, he saw God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And he went forth and warred against the Philistines and break down the wall of Gath and the wall of Jebna and the wall of Ashdod and built cities about Ashdod and among the Philistines. And God helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabians, and against Gerbo, Gerbao, and uh, Mehumnims, and the Mehumnims. Boy, I love these names. And, uh, and the Ammonites gave gifts to Uzziah. And uh, his name was spread abroad even to the end of, end of Egypt, and for he strengthened himself exceedingly. And uh, moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley gate. And at the turning of the wall and fort, he fortified them. And also, he built towers in the desert and digged many wells, for he had much cattle, both in uh, the low country and in the plains, husbandmen also, and vines and dressers, and vine dressers in the mountains. 
and in Carmel, for he loved husbandry. Moreover, Uzziah had an host of fighting men that went out to war by bands according to the number of their account by the hand of GL and uh, the scribe Baez, the, uh, well, I'm butchering these names, the ruler under the hand of Hamai, one of the king's captains, um, the whole number of chief of uh, the fathers of the mighty men, uh, about 2,600. And so, verse 14 says, You Hazah prepared for them throughout all the host of the shields and spears and helmets and haberdons and bows and slings and cast stones and, and bitted all kinds of instruments of war. And so, uh, here he was. He was, a, he was a great man. He was a great king. God helped him. And, uh, but you also find out that he was an imperfect king. In spite of all that he did, uh, in verse number uh, verse number 16 says, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God and went to the temple to burn the incense upon the altar. And of course, you know he was struck uh, there and uh, because of his transgression, he became leprous. His son began to reign. Uh, he was co-regent with, with Uzziah, but he was lifted up. You know what the fact is? No man's perfect. You would think a man that God had done all these things for would have, would have just just kept his cool and you know and said, "Hey, look, you know, God's done all these things for me. I ought to, I ought to praise Him." But you know, he got a little bit lifted up, and he did something that he would not that he had no business doing, and so. Uh, that's just something that you and I need to be careful of. And, uh, you know, so many times God gets a blessing and, and uh, then we, we want to start taking credit for what God's doing. You know, we, we like to say, think, get to thinking that way. You know, God's doing all this because we're such a good people. Now, God was good to you, Zion, because God is gracious. And God's good to you and I because God is gracious. God's not good to you and I because of how good we are. God's good to you and I because He's a gracious and kind God. Then in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, back over here, let me read verses number 22 to verse number 23. God just records His death. 2 Chronicles 26, verse number 22 and verse number 23 says, Now the rest of the acts of Uzziah, the first and last, uh, did Isaiah the prophet, uh, uh, the son of Amon's wife, so Uzziah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the field of the burial, uh, which belonged to the kings, where they said he is the leper, and Jotun his son reigned in his stead. And so, again, Uzziah was not a perfect man, but he was a good man, and he reigned for many years. And under his reign, the nation had become secure. But Uzziah also had a failure. Uh, there in 2 Chronicles 27 uh, says that uh, that uh, Jotham was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem his mother's name also was Jerusha the daughter of Zadok and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord that's not his faith according to all that his father did Uzziah did how be it he entered not into the temple of the Lord and the people Notice this phrase. And the people did yet corruptly. Now, Uzziah was a good king. Served God for many years. His son was a good man who followed the Lord. But the people, the people that Uzziah reigned over did corruptly. Now, God doesn't lay that failure at Uzziah's feet, by the way. And I'm not suggesting that the reason that the people did corrupt it was Uzziah's fault. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that every life is filled with heartaches. Don't you know that a man who loved God and served God for 52 years was heartbroken over the condition of the people? You know, so many times that I heard, I heard him, I, a young preacher preaching on this the other day, just the other day, talking. A young preacher don't have kids, and he talked about all the faith. I heard him preach here last year. He preached about the faith, how how sorry a father Samuel was because Samuel's two sons didn't 
uh, didn't follow in the past of Samuel, their father. Have you ever noticed that God never laid? You know, we lay a lot of things at, at people's feet that God never lays at people's feet. God never blamed Samuel for the way this turns out. God never blamed Adam and Eve for the way that Cain turned out. Matter of fact, the writer of Hebrews says that the reason that Cain slew his brother Abel was because of that wicked one, and he, he, he hated righteousness. And he, he, he slew, slew Abel because his brother's deeds were righteous and his were evil. It's funny how we like to blame everybody else for, for things rather than the people who commit them themselves. Now, I've told you before, my mom and dad raised me a certain way. They didn't raise me to do the things that I did. I did the things that I did because I wanted to. I did the things I did despite all their raising. I know I remember the day that my brother came home. He was taking psychology in high school. And the first day he came home and uh, told mama, mom and dad that all, all his problems were their fault. <laughs> so that didn't go over too well with my dad. He didn't think too much too highly of it. I remember being, I went to, to, to school one day to, uh, to uh, get one of my, sign one of my kids and they were late and I was going to sign them in and there was a boy there in the office and this man came in and he pointed at the boy in the office and he said, I'm after the stupid one there. And he said, he shouldn't have talked to his father and the first thing on that boy's bat, mouth, belly, mouth was, that is not my fault. And his dad looked at him and said, I don't see any shackles on you. You don't belong to the school. I mean, the school, the kid didn't belong to that school. He came to see his girlfriend. He just came in and wasn't supposed to be there. He said, I don't see any shackles on you. Nobody made you do what you did. Whose fault do you think it is? You say, he shouldn't have called him stupid. Well, he did act pretty stupid, I think. You know, sometimes we, got, we get too, too touchy on that thing. You know, sometimes when people act stupid, they need to know they're acting stupid. But we like to blame everybody else. We like to say, well, you know, it's the way I was raised and all those kind of things. Have you ever wondered? Have you ever wondered why some people who were raised with no advantages whatsoever turn out to be good people? And people who were raised with all the advantages under the world turn out to be sorry. Maybe it's time to quit blaming everything on everybody else and look at ourselves. And say, Lord, I'm in the condition I am because of the decisions I've made. It's easy to blame everybody else. But the fact is, life is, is marred by failures. Many of them not things because of things that we've done. Many of them because of things, things that, that, that people just chose to do. And so Uzziah was a good king. God did not lay the problem with the nation at Uzziah's feet. And I don't think we ought to either. So, but it was a time of trouble. Here this good king who had kept the nation on course and God had blessed the nation because of this king. Now this king had died. Joseph and his son was a good man and long as he and his father reigned together, Joseph Jotham was doing well, but how would he turn out? A lot of people start out well as long as, as, long as the, the one that has the influence over them is there. But you wait till that influence is gone and then you find out they're not, they're not really what you thought they were. Isaiah had no way of knowing. And so it was a time of uncertainty. It's what I'm trying to get, to, get across to you this morning. This was a time of uncertainty. And uh, Isaiah didn't know what to expect. Would Jotham keep on as his father had done? Or would he turn and follow the people? And in this time of uncertainty, God gave Isaiah a vision. And here's the vision. Notice he says in the back of him in Isaiah chapter number 6. Isaiah chapter number 6, verse number 1. Again, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. That idea of where he says, I saw. Now, he didn't just glance up there and see it. He, there's a whole series of events that's going to go on in this chapter. And the idea there is that the whole time that this, this series of events was going on, however long it took for it to go on, Isaiah was looking at that, at that throne. 
Isaiah chapter 26 and verse number th verse number 3, I believe it is, he says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind stays upon thee because he's trusted in thee. There's the idea that he kept his mind, he kept his eyes on, on, on God. And you know, we're so, we're so much like Peter, who uh, when Jesus came walking on the water, Peter said, Hey, Lord, if that's you, bring me to come to you on the water. And so he, and Jesus said, Well, come along. And so Peter got out of the boat. And uh, he, here he was walking along. And said, but, but he, he was walking toward Jesus, but then all of a sudden he got to look around at the waves and at the storm and how bad the storm was. And then beginning to sink. You say, why? Why could he, why could he walk on one minute and sink in the next? Well, it depends on where you thought, where your mind stayed. What's your heart set upon? As long as he had his gaze upon Jesus, he was fine. Because he was looking at the one who was greater than the storm. But the minute he took his eyes off the one who was greater than the storm and began looking at the storm and magnifying the storm, the storm got him. And so we need to learn to keep our eyes upon the Lord. Now the word Lord is, is a plural uh, word that means a, a sovereign ruler. A sovereign ruler. This Lord. You know what he was looking at? He had been looking at Uzziah. His trust had been in Uzziah and the goodness of Uzziah. And God said, listen, it's time you quit looking at Uzziah. And you look at me. Because I'm the sovereign ruler of the universe. I hope, I hope you know that this morning. Listen, this, the political times are in a turmoil. Uh, you know, our president now, you know, he's got, he's got all kinds of problems. And uh, by, I hate to tell you this, but the one who gets elected is going to have problems too. They're not, no man's perfect. And if your hope is in man, and, and you're looking at man and hoping that, that, that somehow Washington, D.C. is going to solve all our problems, you are in trouble. That's why America's in the trouble that it's in now. You know, our forefathers looked to God. But now we've been looking to the government for all these years to solve all our problems. You know what? They can't solve them. Because they're just fallible men. And as long as fallible men put their trust in fallible men, you know what you're going to get? You're going to get fallible answers. You and I need to realize that there's a God in heaven who rules in the rules over the affairs of the kingdom of men. Isn't that what God taught Nebuchadnezzar? Drove him out. Made him eat grass like a wild beast for, for seven years. And at the end of the seven years, God returned his sanity to him. You know what Nebuchadnezzar said? Nebuchadnezzar said, I learned a lesson. I learned that God rules in the affairs of the kingdom of men. He said, you know what? He said, I believe I'll trust that God. I don't know about you, but I believe there would be a man named Nebuchadnezzar. Or Nebuchadnezzar maybe, I don't know if that's his actual name or just a ruler name or whatever, but I believe Nebuchadnezzar would be in heaven. Let me ask you this morning, how tore up are you over what's going on? Now, I don't like what's going on, but if you think I'm going to go home and fret and worry and, and sweat and, and pace up and down the floor, you got another thing coming. I remember Brother White used to say, you know, say, he, he said, listen, when I come over here, I preach the sermons that God tells me to preach, I go home, he said, I go to sleep, and I don't worry about it. He said, it's God's church, and if God ain't big enough to take care of it, then he doesn't go about it anyway. The truth of the matter is, all these troubles in the world, there's nothing you and I can do about them anyway. We can't change them. We can't fix them. But there's a God in heaven who can. Now, I think we ought to look to that God. And so God showed him. God, Isaiah looked up there, and he said, you know what? I'm looking at the sovereign ruler of the universe. I don't believe I need to fret and worry. Now you notice that Isaiah says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Uh, I saw, well, yes, Lord, let me get back to verse number one. Uh, I saw also the Lord. Notice what he was doing. He was sitting. Sitting. Sitting content. He wasn't fidgeting. He wasn't twirling his, twiddling his, twirling his thumbs and fret and sweat. Didn't have a handkerchief sweat, wiping the sweat off the brow, you know, and uh, saying, boy, I don't know what I'm going to do. 
a man's died, now what am I going to do? I don't have anybody else that can, can take care of things. You know, God doesn't get upset like that. And if God doesn't get upset like that, neither should his people. You say, preacher, there might be hard times coming. Well, there might be. There might be. But that doesn't change the fact that God still sits on the throne. And that God has promised to see us through. To provide for our needs. And to see us through and eventually take us to heaven. That word throne is a high seat, a chair, a royal throne. In every case, it's a seat of honor. He was sitting in a place of honor. There was nobody above him. There was no greater than he. And uh, so, a uh, word then high comes from a word that means to rise, the soar, to be uplifted. Uh, so he was high and he was lifted up. Lifted up. Again, that's the idea of being exalted or praised. And what do you hear? You hear those seraphim around the throne saying, Holy, holy, holy. And by the way, when you and I get to heaven, you know what we're going to be saying? Where they are thou. We're going to be lifting him up high and holy. We're going to be praising him and giving him glory and honor. Why? Why? When you go back to Revelation chapter number 5, you know why they're, they're giving him praise? Because thou hast redeemed us. Thou hast saved us. Thou hast kept us. Thou hast given us. Thou hast made us. All the things, everything, the, everything in heaven is being praised because of what he did. If you're going to heaven, you're going to heaven because of what he did. You're not going to heaven. The Bible says it's not by works of righteousness we have done, but according to his mercy is saved. If you're going to heaven, you're going to heaven because of what he did. Everything in heaven is about him. You say, well, then that kind of arrogant? No, nope, that's just a, that's, that's the truth. When you get to heaven, you're going to tell the truth. You know what the truth is? The truth is, is you're there because of the goodness of Almighty God. For God so loved the world that He gave His Son to be God. You're in heaven because of the love of God. You're in heaven because of the gift of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Our Lord. Again, no man's going to get to heaven. His pop and suspender straps at God and say, "Look what I did." Every man, when he gets to heaven, is going to bow his unworthy knee and say, "Lord, I don't deserve to be here." But because of thy graciousness, because of thy kindness, I'm here. So he's high and he's lifted up and, and uh, he's being exalted for who, who he is. And then he says in his train, fill the temple. His train filled the temple. Now that's a, a long skirt, a flowing veil. And it filled the temple. And uh, boy, you stop and think about that. All of heaven, you know. Uh, turn me back to Second Chronicles, chapter number six. Let me read this passage. This is, of course, Solomon. Solomon built a temple in the process of wanting to build a temple for God. And uh, Second Chronicles. Well, I guess I might find Second Chronicles. That way. Chapter number six and verse number eighteen. Notice what he said. But will God in very deep dwell with men on earth? Behold heaven, and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house which I have made. His train filled the temple. Heaven to heaven, the heaven of heavens. God's glory, God's greatness. Just, what he would say, pushes out at the walls, you know. You ever filled something up and, you know, you begin to run through the cracks and all those kind of things? That's the glory of God. His praying filled with it. Because you can't contain it. And by the way, that would do us good if we would spend some time looking at God and getting in the glory of God to where His glory began to push out at the seams. A little tear comes to your eyes because you can't contain it. A little praise comes to your lips because you can't contain it. You see, we spend way too much time looking at our problems, looking at the world around us than we do at the God of heaven, at the graciousness of that God. We spend way too much time looking at ourselves and all our faults and failures than we do looking at the one who loved us enough to 
make up for those faults and failures. Matter of fact, I, I, I love this. I, I think I mentioned this the other day. You read over there with Balaam. You remember Balaam? You remember that one that the donkey talked to? Balaam said of, of Jacob, of, of Israel, as he looked on. That you remember that nation that God redeemed over there in Egypt? That nation that grumbled and griped at Burdish Carnelian and had been spent 40 years in the wilderness grumbling and griping. Balaam said, The Lord hath not beheld the iniquity in Jacob. Think about that. As many times as he had to judge them over there murmuring and complaining, they were put under the blood there in, Gen in Exodus chapter number 12. And they were God's people. And God told them, said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. You know what God, when he looked at the nation of Israel, you know what he was looking at? He was looking at that blood. You know what God looks at him when he looks at you and I? He's looking at the blood of his son. If you're saved by the grace of God, if you've been put under the blood of Jesus Christ, then God looks at you, he looks at this at the righteousness of his son where he had made him to be sin for us who do no sin that we might be made what? The righteousness of God in him. And so when God looks at us, he's looking at the righteousness of his son. You say, well, preacher, you don't know how sorry I am and how much I've failed and all that. I know it and God knows it. But that's not what God's looking at. When God slew that little lamb there in the Garden of Eden and clothed Adam and Eve, Every time that God looked down, he didn't see Adam and Eve's lit feet clean. He saw the skin of that the innocent little lamb. And that's what it means to be saved by the grace of God. God puts us into Christ, and when God looks at us, he sees his son. And because of that, he can say, justified. And you and I ought to look up to heaven at such a great, wonderful God and say, God, there's no reason why we should come. Playing. There's no reason why we should be downcast. There's no reason why we should be filled with sorrow and anguish enough. If you loved us enough to do that, do that for us, you loved us enough to keep us every step of the way. Let me ask you this morning. What are you looking at? Are you looking at yourself and your righteousness? If you're looking at that, you're going to always come up short. Unless you and your arrogance you decide to get blinded by the devil. But if you're looking at God, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find one who knows how to meet every need. So he saw how Lord high and lifted up in his train filled the temple and the seraphim. They circled the throne crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of the seraphim. Let me give you a description of the seraphim. The seraphim comes from a word that means burning or poisonous. Serpent. Uh, it's derived from their, the, the serpent's copper color. But there's two ideas of that seraphim. The idea of swiftness, like a serpent's bite. That's always ready and swift to do the Lord's bidding. By the way, that's what you and I want to be. Always ready to do the Lord's bidding. And then the idea of fatality, those who would foolishly. Remember Nadab and Abihu, those who would foolishly approach God. Nadab and Abihu, God had told them how to approach God. Nadab and Abihu, they decided they were going to offer strange fire. They, did, they didn't get their fire from the altar. They just got it and went to God in their own way. There's a lot of people who think they can get to God any way that they choose. But the Bible says, no man can come unto me except. Jesus said, I am the way to truth and life. And no man can come unto the Father except by me. To go any other way is a, a way of foolishness that won't be accepted. And you're going to pay the, the death, the penalty of death for it if you go that way. With six wings, two would cover their, their faces, unworthy to, to, to look upon such glory. Uh, the two that covered their feet, there's the idea, John chapter number 13, I won't take the time to read there, but it talks about he, that, that uh, eight bread would be lifted up his heel against his idea of betrayal. Uh, and, and that custom to, to cover the feet was a sign of modesty and respect. And so the angels covered their feet so lest they be immodest or disrespectful to God. And uh, with two, they, they, they flew again, swift, uh, swift to beat us in universal coverage. And so there's not, a, there's not a place that you'll ever be that God can't find, find you and help you. Then they stood above the throne there and uh, 
and get the idea of Psalm 123, verse number two says that as, as the, the maid waits, waits on her mistress, they were waiting there with the idea. I told you about going to this restaurant. We never, we never had the money to go to one of these kind of restaurants. We went because Uncle Sam was paying for it. And there was a fellow sitting at the end of the table with a towel over his arm. Well, when you got to eat, he came back to the plate. He came and refilled your glass. You know, you didn't have to do a thing. How did you know when it was coming to time to keep your plate? Get your plate? Because he was sitting there watching. That's the way you and I ought to be too. We ought to be so, so, so intent on, on watching God and, and, and knowing what he wants us to do that when he's when he when he nods. By the way, those old those old those old uh, masters, they didn't tell their servants to do that. Really all they had to do was look. They'd look, make a hand gesture with all they had to do, and that servant knew what he was supposed to do. How in two are we would go? So their message, holy, 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 sacred, pure, consecrated, high, set apart from all of them. Listen, there's there, God is not, not a superman. He's not, he's not just somebody in a polished up form of man. God is totally different than man. As a matter of fact, he said, as far as the heavens is above the earth, so are my ways above your ways. He's holy. Then he's the Lord. That's the covenant name of God. That's the one, that great I am. The one, the self-existent one. The one that made that covenant with Abraham and uh, with Isaac and told Moses, he said, hey, listen, your fathers didn't know about this name. But this is this is the name I'm going to give you. You go tell tell the nation of Israel, I am have made a promise to your father, and I am is going to keep it. He's a covenant keeping God. God made a covenant with you and I in the person of His Son. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God said, I'll write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and I'll make it my my responsibility to keep you from this day forward. Aren't you glad of that? The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, I won't take the time to read all these verses, but the whole earth is full of his glory. Listen, there's not a place on this earth you can't see the glory of God. You look at you look at the at the ocean, you see the glory of God and the vastness of it and the and the, and the rolling of the waves and the noise of it. You look at the sunset and the sunrise, you see the glory of God. Everywhere you look out at the stars and the moon and the stars at night, you see the glory of God. The whole earth is full of His glory. Let me ask you this question this morning. Isaiah said in the, my time of trouble, my time of uncertainty, God was gracious enough to allow me to see Him for who He is. God has been gracious enough to you and I to allow you and I to see Him for who He is. The question is, are we spend all our time in front of the tube, watching the news, worrying and fretting over what's going on? Are we spending our time in front of Him and looking up to heaven and saying, God, thank you that you are covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. You made a covenant with me. And that Seal that covenant is sitting at the right hand, of, uh, at your own right hand, in the person of Jesus Christ. What are you doing this morning? Are you fretting? Now, next week we're going to talk about the effects of Isaiah. You say, I'd like to see something like I'd like to see the glory of God in that way. Be careful about that. Because Isaiah got to see the glory of God. But he also got a great responsibility to go along with it. I sometimes wonder if God doesn't answer our prayers the way we want him to answer them because we're not willing to pay the He knows we're not willing to pay the price for it. To whom much is given, of the same shall much be required. Isaiah got to see it. He got his nerves calmed and knew everything would be all right. But he also got a commission out of it. And so, what about you this morning? I'm mainly concerned about you, the state of your mind this morning. God's not giving us a spirit of fear. Are you wondering how worried and threatened? 
If it is, it's because you're looking in the wrong direction. If you're saved by the grace of God, I can tell you based upon the Word of God, everything's going to be all right. Now, if you're not, you're in trouble. Because for those who have never accepted Jesus Christ, they're going to have to stand one day before the great white throne judgment of God and give an account to an angry God over their sinful condition. But for those of us that are saved, those of us that have accepted Jesus Christ, we're going to the judgment seat of Christ. Where we're going to be rewarded for our faithfulness to Him. That's a whole lot of difference. I like that. So where's, where's your gaze this morning? 